when you start to read these things, you're just, you're stunned by it. it it's so unexpected, the accounts of, of what took place. It says, Negroes flee from Forsyth. Enraged white people are driving blacks from county. Drive Negroes from Harrison. Negro residents in panic. If Bob Fancher leaves, there will not be a Negro in Boone County. The only conclusion that you can come to after you look at all this is that blacks feared for their lives and they fled the county. The terror was, was substantial and they did not have time uh, in many cases to sell their land. And after they left, uh, a lot of them were too afraid to come back to try and negotiate any sale of land. So basically, the land is lost. The forced expulsion of African Americans. I am shocked, yet not completely surprised, that this history has remained hidden for all these years. Elliot Jaspin has been investigating the banishment of blacks in the United States. I was on assignment in uh, Berryville, Arkansas. I finished up an interview, and I asked the person, um, by the way, I've been here for four or five days now. Um, I haven't seen a single black. Uh, why is that? She says, oh, well, the Klan keeps them out. I decided I'd look at this a little further, and I was curious how many counties in Arkansas were white or virtually all white. So I got census data, and to my amazement, it was about a third. I said, well, what about the rest of the country? And so I expanded it even more. And again, I saw a whole series of all white counties. In most cases, cleansings typically occurred where there was a relatively small black population. States like Kentucky, northern Georgia, Tennessee, Indiana, Missouri. So was there one place in your research where a county where the greatest number of blacks were um, expelled? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that clearly is Forsyth County, Georgia. There were 1,098 blacks living there in uh, 1912. Within a matter of months, it had dropped to 30. It's the largest racial cleansing in America that I know of. Um, it's also interesting because of this whole land question. Um, it raises the issue of, um, how do we uh, cure the past, in a sense? How do we come to terms with this? What do we do? Forsyth County is a growing suburb of Atlanta. Yet according to the 1980 census, there was only one black living there. And it's a county that remains virtually all white today. We're entering into almost used to be no man's land. If you were a person of color back at the beginning of that bridge years ago, that's where you stopped. I enter into no man's land with Dean Carter, an organizer of a 1987 march to call attention to Forsyth's racial legacy. It was a brotherhood march celebrating Dr. King's uh, holiday. and. To most of us that would march on a Brotherhood march, that was to celebrate the fact that you know, we didn't have any barriers between ethnic groups or otherwise. And Jose Williams called me on the phone. He said, this is Reverend Jose Williams. Mr. Williams proceeded to tell me that he'd walked with Dr. King and said that he wanted to march uh, as long as I could commit to him that it would be nonviolent, of which I did tell him that, that it would be nonviolent, and I would not raise my hand, not once. He had set a spot on Georgia 985 for us to meet. So we would actually get on the bus with him and come in at one time. So it all started very innocently. It seemed as though there wasn't very much like a civil rights mark. It was just an outing. As the bus got to the exit, the bus stopped and we, we looked. The Klan was there. The Aryan Nation was there. The White Brotherhood was there. There was actually uh, seven organizations there.
Reverend Williams said, they blocked the bus, we gotta get off the bus. Then it come down to sheer determination, whether we were or were not gonna march. Of course, there wasn't an option, we were marching. We had reached some kind of abyss where we were not supposed to be. The line of people lying in a roadway trying to drive, drive the marchers out, it's as if they had read what had happened in 1912 and figured they would, they would try to repeat it by forcing blacks out. In 1912, there were 30 to 40 family groups of African-American families who had been driven from the county. Uh, we learned that they had been driven through a combination of intimidate, general intimidation as well as specific acts of violence. This is my grandmother. Her name was Maddie Bell Black. That had to leave from Forsyth County. They came to him and said, all of you got to go. Tonight, you know, got to get out of here tonight, because we're going to kill you. My name is Lily Nash. My dad said that every black person had to leave. They had to be gone before 12 o'clock midnight. Everybody. My grandma, she was one of the people who left earlier in the day. Uh, this black that guy was supposed to have raped this girl. And they, uh, they lynched him that day. They drug him around. And then that night, they went to the black community and ran everybody out. We were about the last ones to leave, my mother and father. They were trying to stay there till the baby got a month old, but they bombed the side of the house. They burned the side of the house down. Why and who have the right to tell any man that he or she cannot live here? Because what, it just ain't right. You can't tell me. God give me that right, too, to live. I just remember Grandma coming in crying, you know? She kept saying she was so hurt. They had never owned nothing before. I don't think she ever got over what happened. They had their farm, they had a house, but they had to leave it. But where is it now? Who got it? I, I wanted to find the land because he before he died, he said, I wish I had um, the deeds to that land my dad owned. The notion of being driven from the land is the, the physical fact of what occurred. And so our effort went back to that fact as a way to get some compensation to the families who've been driven out. How you doing? Oh, gentlemen. After the march, the governor created this biracial committee. And I was on the committee. That whole issue of land was certainly, I think, at the center of it. I was chosen by the Chamber of Commerce to be on that committee. It gave a forum for our community to say, here's how we perceive this. Here's things we can, can do. And our counterparts had the same opportunity, total freedom of speech and freedom of debate. The African-American uh, descendants of those landowners began to wonder, don't they owe us the land? Can't we at least get the land back? The issues on reparations with land and giving back land, that was you know, virtually a non-starter. Nobody's going to, you know, you're probably going to have very little agreement on that. We didn't have that. It was recognized at the very outset that uh, it would probably be a futile effort to try to find a statement 
or a position on all of these various issues on which both sides could agree. In any effort of this nature, it takes time to review and achieve uh, progress. We will see some of that. It may be slow at first. It may uh, take several years to, to see fruition. And day after day after day, we met. And at the end of that year, we had to turn in a segregated report to the governor, their side and our side, because they would never admit that there was any problem, never any acknowledgment that the black people would ever even run out of the county. In the case of banishment, there are compelling reasons for con contemplating reparations. You can ha locate the descendants of people who were banished. You can locate um, the specific property that their, that family lost. And then you can think about ways of going back and recovering that land. And that, I think, is the impetus for saying we want reparations. Reparations for the land that was left behind, not sold, but stolen. Somebody should be held responsible. I meet the Strickland family, descendants of African Americans banished from Forsyth County in 1912. My grandmother used to tell us all about the old homestead that was up in Forsyth County, which was strange to us because we always heard that there's no black people in Forsyth County. That, that's what we were always told. It used to be a saying that we even as young kids heard, you know, don't, don't let the sun go down on you in Forsyth County. How are you? Good, me. I'm <laughs> doing fine. My grandmother, Momo, is 95 now. Right. It's just like yesterday sometimes when she talk about it, that she can remember their, the land that they had there. Oh, you think about the land there once in a while? The land? The land yeah. up where the... I'll always think about it. She really hates that they sold it. Even though I think it was under duress because of the pressure of the, the times and the, uh, the heat from the, uh, I guess it was racism. She's the one that kept the fire burning inside of us because she would never let it go. And she say, um, I want to go up there and see the old homestead. I kind of started thinking, you know, I, she mentioned that so much. I want to I wanna assist in that. And then we kind of planned a trip up there. I am surprised to learn that the Stricklands still have a family burial ground in Forsyth. But it's located on white-owned land. Yeah, that's what your granddaddy, I guess, is one of those. Like, we don't know which one they are. But I think the headstone is right over in here. This ain't no gravesite. Got all this junk down here on our lane. And you know, it was, it was, it just made my stomach sick when I saw old truck doors and truck axles and just general debris and garbage. Yeah, we did. Their hard work helped build this place, but they didn't count. Throughout the United States, Banishment Cemetery is a reminder of what has been lost. It's tangible evidence of the community that once existed there. It is a monument to the past, right? We think of these often as cities of the dead. There are still African-American inhabitants of these banished communities. Just think, this was my granddaddy's land. And it was. 80 acres of it, but there were also around 2,000 acres and all that belonged to different people. But where and who and how it got gone, we don't know. Yeah, and it's one right over here. I don't know. It's, it's a strange thing. It, it's some feel about it that's, that's, that's real for me. It's like standing where my ancestors stood. You know. There's a piece here from our beginning in this land. 
Oh God, we thank you for uh, this plot of land we're standing on. And we're just thankful that the stories that our grandmothers and our grandfathers told us, and we're able to come back and, and see for ourselves the plot of land. Now that we know where it is, we could uh, put a fence around it, go back periodically and keep it clean and make it look like what it is, sacred ground. To us, it's sacred. Sacred ground is more than just a cemetery. It is their family land that should have been passed down through the generations. I follow the Stricklands as they search for the deeds to their ancestors' land. We're looking for Stricklands, original homesteads. Show you where the older books are. Okay, you're looking by names. We have some names. Morgan Strickland, Jim Strickland. We found out that my granddaddy had a nephew that we didn't know about. We didn't know what happened to his property. I think you should go back to find out when the land was purchased. Oh, there's one right here. See, that's Morgan Strickland. And this is May 14th, 1910. His heirs and assigned all the following described properties for Scythe County. Known and distinguished by lot number 1012, 10, 12. 37 and a half acres, more or less. At the courthouse, I was really concentrating on trying to figure out how the land left Morgan Strickland's hands. We just couldn't figure out how it no longer became his. How would I go about finding out who he actually purchased the land from? You can go from what we know currently and trace it backwards. And when you look up their deeds, it will tell you who they bought it from and work your way back Prior to find out that. who they got it from and who they got it from. Okay. We saw where the land became owned by other people and sold by other people, but we never found how it was sold. And it was like Morgan owned it one year, and then the next year it was sold by somebody else totally. These are the same books that are back there. Uh -huh. right? what, what so this is property this? is 1012, Hope Drive. Yeah, Hope. So these properties are 1012. So you the mean this whole thing is 1012? Right, yeah, the whole this thing. square. Wow. It appears like there is some funny business where it may have literally been taken. And then maybe even deeds fabricated or something is the impression that it leaves me with. Something don't tie together, something don't jive. There's a missing link between when it was in our hands or Morgan Strickland's hands to in the hands of the people who sold it to the people who are there now. We've reached what we can do. The rest of it is going to have to be up to the title of attorney and research it back. Justice is really what we're looking for here. Justice, because somebody took advantage of a situation. When I started to research Forsyth County, uh, one of the things that came up was a story that appeared in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which said people were driven out, but no one lost their land. Everybody was able to sell. This didn't seem to make sense uh, to me. So what I did was I went through every parcel of black-owned land to see, indeed, what did happen. With the black-owned land in Forsyth County, what you see is a sale from somebody to a black landowner. And then you don't see the next deed. There's no sale from Joe Smith, the black landowner, to John Doe, who is white. As you go back down the chain of title, what you find is that at some point you run into a hearing for adverse possession. Adverse possession is the way that people have of taking title to property without buying it. And it's of great relevance in these banishment cases because as soon as the African-American owners are off the property, some white folks or other folks come on and start using it as though it's theirs. And then after a period of time, it is theirs, right? And, see, and so what you have is this combination of violence with the legal system, violence to run folks off and then the legal system to change title. One of the interesting things about the Morgan Strickland land is 
that there was obviously an attempt to cure the title by adverse possession. Morgan Strickland buys the land. He then has to run for his life, and he leaves the land behind. I mean, he can't sell it, and so he's gone. You have a whole series of sales of the same piece of land. When you look at the public record, what you find is that when it's sold again, the lawyer that's handling that sale is Phil Bettis. He then goes on to become the head of the biracial commission representing Forsyth County. This is uh, a deed, uh, a fellow named Morgan Strickland bought a piece of property, and Morgan Strickland was black, um, and uh, he left along with everybody else. This was of particular interest because when the Hesters bought a lot on lot 1012, you were the title attorney. Mm -hmm. And following it all the way back mm -hmm. is this, which basically says, the previous guy owned it by adverse possession, which is to say, there never was a sale from Strickland to anyone. And this is not the only one. I found half the, the black owned land apparently was never sold. Is this sort of an open secret in no, your community? No. no. When I'm researching title back 50 years, I don't go back to 1912. That's not on my radar screen to research a, a title in, in 2005. I'm talking about 1984, when mm -hmm. the Histers bought their land. Right, I am too. And, and you did the title search. You went back 50 years. That would have taken in all of these transactions, every one of them. And these transactions, when, the one uh, if, uh, from Teams to Terry, is clearly phony. Phony is a harsh word for that. You, you're, you're really, I'm looking at a sworn affidavit that says that title is acceptable. That's acceptable by title standards in Georgia. I think it's phony to say that I claim title to that property if I've ignored my rights for almost a century. Somebody slept on their rights for almost 100 years and we're still dealing with an issue. When do we complete that cycle? Now, the descendants of Morgan Strickland, of his family, what do you say to them? When I've lost something, particularly my farm or my land, if I feel that's unjust, what invigorates me any more than to go protect that? Federal courts were wide open at that time. They were very present to do so that. You don't feel that there is any, if not legal, moral obligation on the part of this community to make this right? Do I feel compassion to the point of should our community say this is um, something we should address? Yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, I feel that sorriness for them. I feel that compassion, but you know, it's been a long time. Let me ask you a question. What if your grandfather grew up here? Do you owe reparations because he grew up here? I, it's because I would... of a regional okay. presence, do you think that uh, you're responsible? For reparations, do you think taxpayers should pay? Your report echoes exactly that sentiment that the black community uh, is not due reparations for land that was lost during this racial cleansing. Cleansing uh, is an incredibly offensive word. What happened here, and it, it, the, the historical record is extremely clear, is that a person of color in this community, they were ordered to leave. And they weren't ordered to leave because they had done anything wrong. They were ordered to leave because they were black. That is a racial cleansing. I think Phil Bettis uh, embodies the kinds of contradictions and problems that the county itself faces. He has fashioned what is a basically a fable of what took place in Forsyth County. And the fable goes uh, that um, yes, there were uh, unfortunate things that happened. Uh, yes, some blacks were threatened, but we bought the land from those people who left. And so there really was no injury. And uh, that's a very comforting story. It's not a true story, but it's a comforting story. Whose story is the true story? Who has a right to the land? The whites who live on it now, or the blacks who abandoned it in terror in 1912? 
I don't know. One thing is certain, how valuable the property and homes are today. All of that was a part of Morgan Strickland. Morgan. Morgan Strickland, right? This is the 15 acres, the subdivision, but those larger lots are this way. It's pretty land. I set up that little corner right there. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. I like that. It's pretty. It seemed just on the surface as such an impossible thing to do because it, it seems the people that are on the property now, they didn't take it. You know, they somehow, as far as they're concerned, the purchase that they made was legitimate. And then, but maybe the ones that sold it to them maybe was the wrongdoer in some way. Would have been great if we would still had something that, you know, our kids and grandkids would be able to hold on to. We don't have anything to, you know, pass down. And that would have been sort of a legacy lot. There would have been a lot of land there and a lot of blacks there had they not did what they did, had they not ran them all out in 1912. You said that it was a shame that they let this property get yeah, away. Yeah, really did. Would you like we had no back. choice. I know you didn't. Would you like to live back here again? Yeah, fix up, sure. <laughs> Love it back here. It is pretty. Isn't it? Let's get on down the road. OK. The loss of land is really devastating for the African-American community because it's not something that one can recover easily. Many African-Americans have been faced with the obligation in the 20th century to start over once, sometimes twice, sometimes three times, very often as a result of either racial violence or racial discrimination. And being run out of town and losing one's land is one example of that. St. Louis, the southernmost northern city, or the northernmost southern city, is home to two brothers whose family was expelled from Pierce City, Missouri in 1901. My dad always told me that the family was run out of Pierce City. They had to leave Pierce City. But his mother never told him, so I never knew the reason why. About three years ago, I was at a conference, and there's a lady sitting next to me. I asked her, where did she live? She said, Pierce City. And I said, my dad's parents lived there 100 years ago. And she grabbed my hand and said, I'm so sorry. I'm saying, well, why was this woman so sorry? Well, then I was more or less compelled to go to Pierce City. I asked if there was anyone in Pierce City that I could talk to. He went to Pierce City City Hall, and they immediately sent him to me because they knew that I knew what had happened to the African Americans. I laid these pieces of paper out, and he looked at this picture and read down here, group of Pierce City refugees in Springfield. Those are my people. He practically started jumping up and down. That's my great-grandmother. That's Aunt Pinky. That's my grandmother, Uncle Arthur, Uncle Ernest, Aunt Maria, Uncle Jamie, I believe. And these are the two moss, they're mosses. That's all my family. And it even tells a story how they escaped, where the bullets were coming through the house. They went to the cellar, and then from there, they crawled through the grass, hit by the well. Bullets were hitting the wells. So then they ran off into the woods. It's hard to imagine the hope that African-Americans must have held in their hearts. They come to a place where they can own land. 
They come to a place where they can go to school. They come to a place where there is seemingly uh, at least some sense that they have a right to exist. And I think there was a tremendous hope. And they began to settle the land, to homestead it, and to try to create lives for themselves. If 1901 had never happened, my family might still be in Pierce City. They owned a two-room home in Pierce City. They were very religious people. They might still be there. This is, this is your great-grandmother. That's Armenta Cobb. She's buried in Springfield, Missouri. This is her husband, James Cobb. James Cobb was the person I couldn't find when I did my research through Missouri. So I hired a researcher from St. Louis to try to find James for me. They found James on the death rolls in Pierce City. They found that James had died in 1898. He was buried from the AME Church in Pierce City. They found a location where James would bury in the Pierce City Cemetery. Here's a picture of the Pierce City Cemetery when I was down there trying to find my great-grandfather's grave, and they would not help me find his grave. Well, you see three people standing here. This is the grave digger, Hollis. This is his assistant, and this is the president of the Cemetery Association. So she walks over to me and asks me if I had a deed for the lot James Cobb is buried in. So then she said that there's a tax for every year that the person has been in the ground. It's a dollar a year. I never heard of such a thing. I said, well, that's no problem. How you want it, cash, check, credit card, you know? Well, then that, they backed off of that. That's when they just said, well, we're just not going to do it because it's not concrete enough evidence for us to dig where you want us to dig. Well, I told them that, well, maybe we'll have to get a court order and do DNA. And the grave digger turned and said, nobody's going to dig a grave up here ever under any circumstance. Why is this so, in, so important to you to do? Closure. You know, the, the, the incident in Pierce City, like I told you, I was not really into addressing it. I was going to let sleeping dogs lie. But I was also looking for James Cobb. When I found that the incident has a direct bearing on James and my family and their peace of mind with knowing that their father and my great-grandmother's husband is buried back in Pierce City where they cannot go to pay tribute to him, then it became a personal thing with me. So my goal is to get James exhumed and move to Springfield. It seems like a simple request, a personal form of reparations. Why was the community so hostile to that? I drive to Pierce City to see Murray Bischoff at the local newspaper to learn more about the expulsion of black citizens in 1901. There was nothing in town that told you what happened. The only thing that existed had been the original newspaper article in the, in the Pier City paper. And I read that article, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I said, what in the world is this? So I crafted together a three-part story that we ran in 1991, on the 90th anniversary of the event, it was a sensation. And the old timers in Pierce City were enraged. I had a phone call from one senior citizen who flat out said, let old soldiers lie. That represented a lot of people in Pierce City, how people in Pierce City had been and it became something that was very much a part of the community's character. When I had moved out here, I didn't know any of this. And I was sitting at my wife's cousin's house one day, 
and there was a fella visiting there, and he said, you know, I just like it around this part, and I like it around these parts just because there's no niggers. And I found even the best people in town had the N-word in their vocabulary. It was part of their culture. It wasn't necessarily a declaration of hostility, but it was there, and I knew it. I recognized it. It, it made me uncomfortable. The whole culture of this area evolved out of the eviction of those African Americans from Pier City. So I'm from New York City, and truthfully, I'd like to know anything that people may have heard about or know about long, long time ago. One of the things that I'm interested in is that what happened in Pier City in 1901 when the black population was wiped out. Do you know anything about that? There used to be colored people in Pier City. There was a church on the corner of Commercial there. And there was uh, several families that lived here. What happened to the colored people in Pier City? They had a hanging here in Pier City, and the colored left. My daughter-in-law worked at the paper. They, they've done stories on that since then. Oh, yeah, Murray at the Monet Times did a, was doing a book on it. There he is. researched it. He made a lot of people mad. People won't talk about it. I lived in Wentworth, the next little town over, and so you know, it was just always, uh, we just always said that there wasn't any, never was any, um, oh, well, colored people here. And they never, you know, we never seen any uh, colored people. And, you know, they, I think they put to death a colored man. The time that I've been in the, in the, in the town, I've never seen anybody. You've never black. seen a dark uh, no. Negro. Despite the candor of the seniors, I feel the weight of the town's denial of its past. Charles has asked Pier City to do something it seems unable to do to take responsibility for its history. My name is Carol Hirsch. I was the first lady mayor in Pierce City. I've lived here all my life. My family was here when it was created. There were some stories that most people didn't want to talk about. There was a black spot on our history. My grandmother was, was a young girl when the tragedy happened. She told me the mob formed at the jail. They came down the street. They formed a line. They said they stood shoulder to shoulder and just fired across into what we believe was the black community in this area here. I can hear it. It must have been horrible. Are their descendants owed something, do you feel? Uh, probably owed an apology. I know that you have been in correspondence with Charles Brown. My understanding is that Mr. Brown wants to remove the remains of his great-grandfather. Yes, he does. That, I, now, I may be mistaken, but I understand when he first came to town, he only wanted to mark his great-great-grandfather's grave. But he had an incident at the cemetery, and through Murray, I found out that it was not a good visit. I think he got really upset, and that's when he decided he wanted to move him. He wanted to move him out of perhaps harm's way. I still feel like there can be a compromise. Come, come walk with me. Yes, ma'am. What are you thinking? 
like my great grandmother left here in 1901. She left him here and she couldn't come back here. And to know that he's going to be with her, you know, he, uh, spiritually. Spiritually. Knowing that he'll be there. Spiritually, he's already with her. Yeah. But you know, if, if you could help all of us have closure with, with stones here, and we know there, and then that would be uh, respected. Mm -hmm. and their names were there, and we'll shoot, we know there, we've met you, we, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think it would help all of us. Well, you know, the thing about it is that Hazelwood is closer to St. Louis. Mm -hmm. It's where the other members of the family are. Pierce City is not a place where they would probably want to come. But it's so peaceful here with, with you know, the wildflowers and the birds. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my parents are buried right over there. You won't find a more peaceful place. Mm -hmm. They asked me if I would be willing to put a monument near to where he's buried and we have a ceremony. And I said, well, what does that do? You know, I just think that um, we'll have to come to a meeting of the minds because we're not the cause of him still being here. You know, we were people that were progressive, uh, educated. So who knows what we'd have done here? We were never given a chance. But that's all behind us now, you know. How you doing today? I'm trying to see Don Lakin. This is me. Pleasure to I meet you. I thought you was going to call me before you come. I know, but we got to town today, and right. we went over to the cemetery and got a little excited. Got a little excited? <laughs> yeah. How'd you get excited? Well. Are you Charles? I'm Charles. Charles. This is my brother, James. How you doing? Hi, James. How are yeah. you? I was up to the cemetery. I've been up to the cemetery a couple times mm -hmm. looking at that situation. And I don't know who you're going to get to do this. I mean, you have to go through somebody to do it, but it's it, they're going to have to make sure that that. Do you have the capacity to do this? Yeah, I do. But if we open that grave, mm -hmm. if that isn't your great grandfather, mm -hmm. then you're disturbing someone else's grave. If I didn't have the records that said that the family purchased the plot up there. If I didn't have the newspaper article that says he was buried up there in that cemetery, then I probably wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you. Well, as I said, the only way that I know to go about it, because you don't want, as I said, you don't want somebody buried up in, in next to your family. It's not your family. OK. The grave's unmarked, and, and that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. I assume that I ought to get a hold of the county attorney and find out the right course to go about this. What kind of time frame are we looking at uh, response from the attorney? I don't know. That's the truth as I can be. I know you've heard of what happened here and everything about it. If you were me and you found out about it and it was potentially your family, and the rest of your family were not able to come back the, the year after they were expelled to put a wreath on his grave. When you asked me how I felt when I first came here, that's all I thought about. It yeah. hasn't changed inside for you as far as family, as far as your family. And, I, and yes, I understand that. This is your copy of the news or newspaper article. It was in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. That's our great-grandmother. That's Aunt Pinky. That's our grandmother. It's Uncle Ernest and Uncle Arthur, and those are all cousins. That's yours.
if Pier City works with me on this, this would go a whole long way to show that Pier City has changed. In a situation like this, you need to reclaim the truth of history. Ideally, uh, someone from the perpetrator culture is willing or able or accessible in some way to help you find the truth, which is even more recognizing than having to find it on your own. But uh, finding the truth and reclaiming your family history, knowing what happened, is enormously important to feeling repaired. This area here is a little bit different. It appears like there's a grave right, here. Right, right. And, you know, there's a possibility that there's one here. Do you know of anybody else that died at the same time he died that they would have used the lock? No. And really, that's what we wanted when we came down here before. If you scrape this across here, we see the differential, then we know there's a body there. That's what we wanted. OK. Well, I'll get started and see what I can do. OK. Uh, Is that fair enough? If, yes. I mean, you know. Yes. I'll help you if I can, Charles. Okay. That's all I can tell you. OK. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you think that this action that you're doing in some way may contribute to forgiveness? It'll be a very satisfactory thing for them to know that that Pierce City is willing to help them do what they want to do, that nobody's against what they want to do. And I don't really think that they ever felt that people would be against what they done anyhow. I, 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 there don't seem to be that type of gentleman. I think it'd be a closure for them. They don't want to go back, they don't want to come back to Pierce City to decorate their granddad's grave on account of the things that maybe happened to their family in this area over 100 years ago. But there has to be a forgiving area somewhere in there, too. A forgiving area. Maybe repair begins in that elusive space where perpetrators and victims find common ground. How are you? OK. Good. We're going to do this as respectful as we can. Okay. And I want you to understand oh, that. Oh, I understand. But, you know, and I don't know what we're going to get I when understand. we get down there. I know. Okay. Maybe. That's 
bone. That's bone. That's bone. Yeah. That's bone. How you doing? Good, man. Feel good? Yeah. Been like your smile, man. You told us this is it. I know daddy smiled. It's been a long, drawn-out procedure for Charles, and, and it's... He can go home tonight and know that he got accomplished what he wanted to get accomplished. So I'm pretty well satisfied with that. Father, we come here gathered, try to put closure, do everything that we found. Heavenly Father, we hope that the Cobb family is at peace now. In your name, amen. Lower it down. There you go. Do you have uh, your bill made out? Are you going to mail it? No. Or... I'm, I'm going to come over here and let's talk about that. I, this ain't my everyday run, but if I charge you $750 for everything, is, is that being yeah. fair? What I wanted to tell you is, and I really didn't do this because you're an elected official, and I didn't want you to have any problems with your yep. city, but, you know, my family feels that the best way to have any sort of healing is for Pier City to actually make some kind of con concession for this to understand what went on, and that we feel that, you know, we were trying to keep the cost down, but yeah. our thought was for Pierce City to come forth and pick up the tab for all this. There's a letter that was being mailed to the mayor today, and I, I really felt bad about not telling you beforehand, but, you know, the person to start all this rolling was you. Yeah. And, you know, I really appreciate that, and I just hope that I don't offend you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to give my cast, cost my casket from John Blake. I understand. Uh, you know, and, I know, and I'm not I know. Being, I know. I know, but see, yeah. what's gonna happen is, we'll see what the fallout is, and if things, yeah. if things go down, then, right. you know, I'm an honorable yeah. man. We'll do what, you I, know. I'm fully aware of that. Yeah, like I said, I just w didn't want you yeah. Yeah. to be in an awkward situation yeah. Yeah. with yeah. anything yeah. involved. Yeah. You know. Well, and, uh, and I hope you understand my situation, yeah, yeah. but, so. Don said that Charles was going to send the city a bill for $6,000. It's upset me very much. I, I've spent a lot of, of um, just natural goodwill. Pierce City is like my family, you know. I, I don't want anybody to, to look bad at my family or my town. But I feel like someone turned the tables on me. I, I was maybe used. I, 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 I want someone to tell me I wasn't, that I was helpful, that I wasn't duped. I, I, I had no idea where this was going, other than yesterday I thought that would be a peaceful end. I'm going on home. Mark, where should we go with you? Uh, where do you want to go? Anywhere you're comfortable. Your office? I guess he was, what I understood was that he thought this was a, by having the city pay for the disinterment and so forth, it was a way to kind of bring healing and closure. I guess that's where I parted company with him because it, it really is something important. It's something uh, uh, of great gravity, and you don't solve that with a few bucks. That's what we got yesterday with the letter. I, I didn't think of this in terms of reparations. I, I thought of it in terms of, uh, you know, money being asked to do what money can't do. Um, no matter what's said, it'll be too little, it'll be too late. Uh, dollars, you know, how do you take a subject that serious and translate it into dollars? Who do you pay? I don't know. I have a radical solution for you. What happens if you 
put an ad in the newspaper saying that all the descendants of the African Americans that were expelled, thrown out of Pierce City, we will give you your land back. Please come here because we would like to create a vibrant, diverse community. Uh, it is a radical solution. It's an interesting solution, and it makes sense uh, uh, late at night, about 3 in the morning, uh, when people are just getting together and talking and not paying too much attention to who they and we and uh, property and how all that actually gets done. Uh, who do we take that away from? I, I saw the letter that he sent to the mayor. And uh, uh, I think that, I don't think there's any amount of money that'll ever change the heartache that was caused in 19, what was it, 1901 and 1901. I, I, I think you could take millions and millions of dollars and it wouldn't change anything. It still would have the same hurt but what else can be done about it? I mean, as I said, bearing the expenses of it, don't, I don't know, I don't know. And how do you fix it? I mean, there's no way to fix it. There's no way to fix the things that was written in the St. Louis paper. I don't know what the answer is. One of the things that's really important is for black people to be able to have a way, an arena in which they can articulate what reparation would mean to them, even if it's only a fantasy that cannot be actualized. I think on the white end, whenever you feel either personal guilt or cultural guilt. Reconciliation can't really happen unless you feel like you gave something that had meaning. You have to feel that you gave and that it actually gave the person something. Not that you imagine it erased everything, but that it really helped. The failure of Pier City compels me to look for other solutions for something else that might help. In the all-white town of Harrison, Arkansas, a group of citizens has created a task force to address their racial legacy. What we've done in Harrison, Arkansas, has been voluntary repentance. Nobody forced us to. Uh, and also the, the type of uh, reconciliation we've tried to do has been meet people where their needs are rather than just a blanket statement for, for those that, uh, uh, who may have been involved or not involved. It's, it's just it's such a broad thing to do reparations. It's like, who do you punish? I mean, it is a lawsuit. It is, you know, they call it awarding damages to, to people who were wronged or descendants of wrong. Thank you. 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 Let's pray, and then let's just go right into praise and worship. I've uh, been living in Harrison about 11 years. Came here by way of Wimberley, Texas. If you just moved to Harrison, there was nothing in the community to throw any alarms or red flags. It was just a nice, quiet little town. And then this article came out, and uh, for me, that was the first time I ever discovered any of the history of Harrison. I went to work on the 1st of November. A team from a junior high school in Fayetteville had played ball in Harrison. A parent who traveled with the team had been very distressed by the, the treatment he felt the kids had gotten. We had a very gifted athlete that was black, and he was subject to racial slurs the whole night. After the game was over, they refused to shake her hands. So we left the field, went to buy the kids a meal before they traveled back to Fayetteville. It was Halloween, and somebody had come in in a ghost suit 
to get a free Sunday. And the kid had thought it was it was the Klan. The black boy, you know, looked up, was or looked, yeah, you know, was just, just mortified, scared to death. You know, I saw fear, horror in his eyes. He ran off to the bathroom. I mean, here's a kid who comes over here. Every time he comes here, he's scared that the Klan's going to come and get him. I mean, that's terrible. I hate that. You know, that that's where that began to really gnaw at me. Eventually, I published a series of articles in the paper. People got pretty upset. And basically, what I heard was, we don't have any racial problem here. Right after I read this article, within two or three days, uh, the head of the Ku Klux Klan was on TV. He made this comment, I speak for, for white Christians in Harrison, Arkansas. And that just antagonized me to say, no, you don't. You don't speak for me. I began uh, looking to how do we solve this problem? We've got a community of 12,000 people, almost no African Americans, very little diversity, but it's been that way almost 100 years. How do you work with a, a race that's not there in your community? How do you make reconciliation with somebody who's no longer there? So we first started with ourselves. We started with a, an acknowledgement of what happened in 1905 and 1909. We had a symbolic washing of each other's feet before the community, and we said a prayer of repentance. So one of the things that we've done is an affirmation of wholeness that from this point forward, we're not gonna allow these things to happen again. Recently, we just gave away a couple of scholarships, and I thought that was fitting that as 100 years later, where blacks were driven out of town, now there's a scholarship given to minority students to aid them in their college and their education to come to Harrison, so it's a, quite a big reversal. We started out calling it the Aunt Vine Scholarship. Aunt Vine was the last black lady that stayed in Hurston. She didn't leave during the race riot, stayed with the family that um, she had been with for years. We wrote up her attributes and why we wanted to honor her, and it was a concrete example of what we wanted to connect with our past. Wow, she looks like my great, great grandma. How do you feel about this this scholarship they gave you then? What do you mean, how do I feel? Well, you know, I mean, I, I understand that they think that the scholarship is a way that is helping them heal and change their image. I really ain't thought about I, I just thought that, for real, just to be real, like, I was like, well, they just trying to help us out because, you know, minority in Harrison have a scholarship, you know, for black, you know what I'm saying? It'll stand out, you know? And how would your folks feel about it coming up? My mom, I don't know, was like, this it's a good opportunity. She worried about me, and more a lot of people worried about me. Cause they was like, you know, we don't want nothing to happen to you. I was scared too. A scholarship is a wonderful thing and very important to seed into young people, but it's somehow over there. And it gives you the sense of your own magnanimity and a sense of your own generosity. And that's important for people to recognize that reparations is not a one-shot deal. It's a long-term commitment to re-identifying, to re-imagining um, what your community stands for. And so if you're not prepared to engage in that long-range project, then you may want to do a quick fix. The question then becomes, what is the appropriate means of addressing the harm here? As the research committee and began brainstorming some of the things that we want to... For the last year and a half, I've been involved in the task force for race relations. The reason that the task force was formed is that Harrison was a place where black Americans did not feel free to come didn't feel comfortable spending the night. So it would not be difficult at all for people who are outside of the area to say, this was a place where racial cleansing took place. It is a place where the Klan lives today and come to their own conclusions. If I moved uh, just over there across the way, would I be welcomed? I, I wouldn't be happy. Why? 
It's because I want to preserve our community, our culture. I think I have a heritage that is worth preserving. Burning many crosses these days? <laughs> it's a cross lighting. Excuse me, you're not burning crosses anymore? It's a cross lighting. It's an old Scottish symbol of a cross uh, embracing the fire of Christ. And uh, the clan simply reenacts this uh, old uh, Scottish tradition. The burning cross, as I would call it, is used as a symbol of terror. I think you're being a little disingenuous when you say that a burning cross is not Oh, it is. I agree. To it is. Blacks in the American South. The Klan is an easy target for blame. But are they really the cause of the town's negative image or a symptom of it? People in town that I've spoken to in some ways say that you're the reason why Harrison has a negative reputation. That they, that everyone outside of Harrison has this uh, terrible um, impression of it as a place oh, they're that's lying. racist. They're lying. Tell me what you think the image well, of Harrison Well, I mean, Harrison has, has doubled in population since I moved here. Uh, Harrison listed, according to the Chamber of Commerce website for Harrison, Harrison listed as one of the top 100 places, best places to live in the country. It's a good community. A lot of people are moving here because it does reflect what they are as a people. So in some sense, you feel comfortable that you're speaking for the majority of the people? I would say the majority of white people in Harrison would not want minorities moving here. People have come here because of what it is, not because of what they think it might be someday. Come on in here. OK. Talk to me a little bit about Harrison. Why did you come to Harrison? Why did I come to Harrison? For two reasons. Uh, the uh, low cost of living the low cost of real estate, and uh, probably more importantly than anything else is lack of blacks. How'd you know that there were no blacks in Harrison? Because I'd been to Harrison many times visiting. I can give you probably 200 names of people who have retired here and they tell me that the reason they chose to retire in Harrison was the exact same reason I did. And I mean, they're, and they are uh, from all over the United States. If Bob Scott and Tom Robb are to be believed, Harrison has become a magnet for like-minded people to call home. At the Chamber of Commerce, the public face of the community, I wonder how they represent the town. We are not the same community that we were in 1905 and 1909. And even in those days, it was a small percent of the population that was involved in that. And so while we want to acknowledge that, acknowledge the hurt of that, we know that we have moved past that, and that's not the community that we are today. If you're an all-white community, mm -hmm. Maybe that says that if you're not white, you're not welcome. The idea of this racist enclave in the hills wasn't what we know ourselves to be today. My concern was that that's the image out there and that's what's being promoted and publicized about your community. I have something that confuses me. There are four flags hanging outside, mm -hmm. one of which is a Confederate flag. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that communicates that I am welcomed here mm -hmm in Harrison. The reasoning behind the flags is historical. They were put up to say, here is the five governments that have governed this particular area. And it's the Spanish flag, the French flag, the United States flag, and the Confederate flag, because that was all the different parts. It is not meant as a slap or a sign that says, you are not welcome here. If the flags honor Harrison's past, how can the town truly hope to make amends for the banishment of its African-American citizens? People who are on the task force for race relations are very concerned about Harrison's image in the outside world. How do we deal with this 
in a substantive way. And I think that that is, in fact, the work of the task force. I want to welcome all of you to the first meeting of the research committee. We are honored to have David Zimmerman with us. Welcome to our group. Thank you very much. This is a map of Harrison and marked in all the shaded lots are lots that at one time belonged to black people. Richard Fancher, Joseph Joslin, and George Harrison bought the AME church. William and Fanny Stinnett, whose son was hanged in 1909, lived right there. Robert Warren and his wife lived there. Elijah Armstrong and his wife and children lived there. Thomas Horton, who was a blacksmith and Aunt Vine's son, lived right there. Aunt Vine lived in a cabin behind the Wilson's house, which was on lots 15 and 17. To me, one of the ironic things about Harrison today is you can walk right to the place where Aunt Vine's house was, and it is in the middle of a public park. But there is nothing in those parks that indicates that a black person ever drew breath in this county, much less lived and died here. My idea is you put up a marker on the square that says something like 250 yards east of here was the center of the African-American community of Harrison, Arkansas, which was destroyed in two separate episodes of white mob violence in 1905 and 1909. I think we agree with that statement, but I think it's going to take much more because I think we've done that. We've said it through National Day of Prayer. National Day of Prayer. We've mm -hmm. said it through uh, a, a very conscious link with uh, a, an AME church in Helena. We have done it, but, but you're saying until we do it, something visible. I know that there are people who say, oh, this should be done, that should be done. But to me, the truth is the truth. And the day that you finally stand up in front of everyone and say, this is what happened, is the day that you're free from having to carry it around as a dark secret. And, and I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm saying it's going to take more than that, I think. Because I have a friend who, who was ministered down in a, a little bit south of here, and he said that his daughters would not spend the night in Harrison. And I said, why? What is, that? what is it that we can't overcome? His comment was, and I quote, it's Tom Robb. No, sir. The Klan is here because they're comfortable here. But I did locate the black... Permanent markers in the physical space. This is a critical part of reparations. That there has to be a way in which the communities themselves reflect the reality of what happened. You can go to communities all throughout the United States and you'll see markers for various events that happened but you'll n almost never see a marker that reflects the history of racial violence. Despite the town's efforts, which seem sincere, I can't help thinking, is the scholarship or a monument really enough? 1889, but no name. And when, when did you say Aunt Vine was... Uh, when died? did she die? Yeah. 1914 or 1916. Let me see. That's a small stone. An infant, maybe. Yeah, you an infant know. Would be given that size. Born in 1647. Wow. Jones, Jones, Jones. Well, it's a great mystery to me that there's no record of where. Was yeah, very... under the circumstances that she was the last black to live in Harrison for any number of years. Aunt Vine, the last black person to live in Harrison, has a scholarship in her name, but no grave marker. This is the lingering legacy of the expulsion of black citizens. We remain invisible. I 
I returned to St. Louis. Did Charles succeed in getting Pierce City to pay for the reburial of his great-grandfather? Why is it so hard to find common ground? You know, when I first started making these rolls, I didn't know how to do it. And everybody in the neighborhood were guinea pigs. Everybody got to try some. While they were bad, once I got good at it, nobody gets any now. <laughs> <laughs> so where are things? The mayor put a article in the Pier City paper. He did not respect me enough to write me or call me or want to dialogue with me. Uh, I'll just read you just a couple lines of what the mayor says. Dear Mr. Brown, I hope you won't mind that I've taken a few days to think about your letter before replying. After all, yours was a serious letter about the most serious of subjects, and I wanted to make sure I did full justice to you and your family's concern. Now, this is a letter in the newspaper. I did also say that I was sorry you asked to be paid, because I think the shock and outrage you write you rightfully feel at the events of 1901, in which I think any civilized person shares, are only diminished by the suggestion that somehow someone can just open a checkbook in 205. Well, I didn't say just open a checkbook. I said reimburse us for what we put out, and I will come down there and stand before the town and vindicate the town and say this is not a town of 1901. And I told Don, who was the undertaker in charge, who was also the coroner for the area, I told him that I will pay him in a timely manner based on what happens with everything, the fallout from all of this. Well, I got a, a phone call telling me that I was a crook, that I was trying to not pay Don, and that I was trying to uh, hold the city hostage. So I immediately went and got a, a cashier's check for the amount that Don wanted, and I paid him. Excuse me a minute. Help me understand why you didn't let anybody know that these were your intentions or desires to begin with, to have them at the very least reimburse you for your costs as a way to bring about healing. I didn't trust them. And the reason I didn't trust them because of the fact that they wanted to hide all this in the past. What did you put on the gravestone? We haven't put a gravestone there yet. We're still waiting. What am I waiting for? I don't know. I guess maybe I'm hoping that Paris City will come to me and say, we need to address that tombstone. And that way, then they would help us in the healing process. I leave Charles to attend the Strickland's family reunion. Perhaps they found a resolution to the loss of their stolen family land. Look at your grandma, Oh, Mom, that look like me. <laughs> He's the fifth generation. <laughs> He's the fifth generation. Uh, Fire, would you like to hear this? Excuse me, Miss McCain. I want to tell you about a project that we were working on. Several of us got together, and we were had done some research at the Forsyth County Courthouse on some of the property that involved our family. And we're not sure if it's fraud, but we just wanted to share it with you so that you would be aware of it, OK? We have researched the titles as far as we can go without legal assistance. So many family members feel that they want to pursue it further, and I had said that this would not be a decision made at the family reunion because it would be an emotional decision, and what does it mean if they find out that there's fraud, and if any money swaps hands, none of us will live to see it. My child will not be living to see it, and my child's children will probably not be living to see it. If we really follow this, you know, it could have a definitive end of some wrongdoing and some of the property was taken unjustly, and we, you know, you can maybe be, be documented that that was true. It would be good for me to have just a definitive answer. Everybody. 
in the formal legal sense, the time had passed for them to, to bring to court a claim for the expulsion. Our conclusion was that the litigation prospects were not good. But when those violations have happened on such a grand scale, you have to, if you're going to be fair about it, acknowledge that they only happened because it was allowed by the greater society. The issue goes well beyond a legal question. The time has run out for anybody to come forward and say, I have legal claim to this land. But it's a question of some things that the law doesn't address, which is what is right, what is just. And it's our sen sense of rightness, it's our sense of justice that uh, I think uh, comes into play here. Okay. That black owned land was indeed appropriated by the whites. These black landowners were victimized and they deserve the compensation. Banishment causes losses of all sorts. There is loss of opportunity to interact with folks who have been banished. There's loss of community. And those things are very hard to get back. And I think that's one of the things that the reparations movement promises. It holds out the promise of reconstruction of the African-American community reconstruction of the morality of the white community. Reconstruction of the entire American community.